it is wherever you are. My name is Suzanne Klein. I want to welcome you to Congregation Darche Noam and to the 13th Elka Klein Memorial Lecture. Elka Klein was a young historian, a medievalist, a scholar specializing in the Jews of Spain. Darche Noam was her first shul. It was here she acquired the love of Judaism that enriched her life. It was here she found the fascination with Jews and Jewish life that permeated her scholarship. Her family considered it fitting that there be a memorial to her here. She was an avid and gifted teacher. Again, fitting that she be remembered in the context of learning about Jews and Jewish life. Elka was intrigued by the ways that Jews managed their lives as they moved, whether for opportunities or for refuge, and how they carried their Judaism with them. She would have been fascinated by the story that Professor Mark has to tell. You're muted. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Martin Klein. And uh, before I introduce Peter, uh, Peter Mark, uh, I have two requests. Uh, first, if you have any problems with clarification of terms or data, uh, Professor Mark will stop at about the 20 minute mark. And, and you will be able to get clarification. Second is that after the lecture, we will have a half hour of questions. You should put your questions in the chat and address them to Deborah Eklaw. She will select uh, and, and, uh, and forward the questions uh, to Peter. Let, let me also make an offer. If, if uh, there are a lot of questions and people don't get all their questions answered, please feel free to write me after this lecture is over and I will either forward the questions to Peter or if I'm capable of doing so, will answer them myself. Uh, Peter Mark and I first met in Senegal. We were living in the same pension and took our meals together. I was a veteran. 12 years, uh, 10 years deep into research in Senegal. This was probably my third or fourth visit. Uh, and he was nervously facing his first field research. We have been, we talked constantly and we have been friends ever since. He survived six months on a heavy research diet in the, uh, in the, the Casamance area of Southern Senegal and has gone on to have a brilliant career while teaching at Wesleyan University in Connecticut and commuting to France, Germany, and Portugal. Uh, he is both a cultural historian and an art historian. His work, six books and countless articles has largely been on the Upper Guinea coast, the area between Senegal and Sierra Leone. Though he has also written on the image of Africans in European Renaissance art. As an art historian, he has been concerned to study and interpret objects in the historical context of their creation. He has also been particularly concerned with interactions between Europeans and Africans and with the presumed racism of 16th century European society, which is why he and a Portuguese colleague, uh, Jose uh, da Silva Corta, who I think, is prop I think is with us in this room, uh, found an interesting settlement of, of uh, Portuguese Jews on the coast of Senegal. Uh, Peter, why don't you tell us what you found? Thank you. Before I start telling what Jose and I found, this is such an honor to be asked to speak in memory and in honor of an outstanding scholar of Jewish history to be invited by two friends of long date and to be invited by Marty 
old friend, my role model, and my mentor. From just scanning some of the names who have showed up by Zoom, today's electronic or maybe electric audience includes scholars, Marty's intellectual offspring, even I think of the second generation. That must make me the adopted offspring, which I am proud to be. Thank you very much, Marty and Susan. Now comes the challenging part. Uh, one colleague said I could not I could correctly observe that I could not possibly be an art historian because I'm so uncomfortable with the technological aspect of showing images. They were right. Do you now see as on the screen what is a map of West Africa and the title of the talk across the top? Yes. Good. Hopefully that will continue to be the case. This is the story of three dozen Jewish men in West Africa, some of them coming from Portugal to escape the Inquisition. So, well, our first little problem advancing the slide. Good. Um, I seem to be stuck. And this is, uh, aha. Okay, there, there's um, a little bit of problem with the control, but hopefully we'll be able to fly by the seat of our pants. Peter, try to use the little arrows at the bottom of the slide. I am, and they have not been working. Now they are working again. Okay. I suspect that every time that somebody comes in from the waiting room, it blocks my controls. Is that, does that make sense to you? Okay, well, we will, we will make do. Three dozen Jewish men who in about 1610, some came from Portugal, as I say, to escape the recently established Inquisition. Others came from the recently established Jewish community in Amsterdam. These men arrived in Senegal during the first decade of the 17th century. And before I go any further, it's absolutely important uh, that I share the fact that all of this research was joint, that Jose Orta and I have been working together uh, as a, a kind of odd couple for 18 years now, and that this book, the cover of which you see is, is uh, the result, the first result of, of that collaboration, 50% and 50%. So these three dozen Jews arrived on the West African coast, approximately where the green uh, line first touches the African continent coming from Lisbon, a trip that at the very fastest would have taken them two weeks, heading south and longer going north, generally for three or four weeks. They traveled at first, that is in the, in the 16th century and early 17th century, they would have traveled in a caravel looking much like this picture. The men were Portuguese speaking Jews, Ostenassal, people of the nation, they settled in a remote corner of the Spanish Portuguese commercial empire on the coast of West Africa. There on the so-called Petit Coast or Little Coast of Senegal, they constructed a synagogue, they held religious services, they even welcomed a rabbi from Amsterdam. And they developed a thriving trade in ivory and in dried cattle, cattle skins. Here's a, a overall map of Upper Guinea. And do you see the arrow? Which I'm putting along the coast, I hope so. Yes, good. So the Petit Cot is this part of the coast of Senegal just below the Cape Verde Peninsula. For those familiar with Africa today, the capital city of Dakar is where the arrow is. This is an area that was relatively well protected from uh, prevailing winds from the Atlantic so that boats could, could uh, more safely offshore. The story will continue further south across the Gambia River 
And at that point, rainfall begins to increase rapidly in, in the 50 or 60 miles that the arrow uh, shows here, rainfall increases from about 30 inches a year in a good year to 50 inches, making it possible, making it possible for wet rice cultivation from this part of the coast on south. I will give, put terms up for a moment so that you can become familiar with unfamiliar spellings, uh, but the region that I next speak about, Casamont, is right where the arrow is, and the important trading town, which figures towards the end of the talk, Cacheo, is just 30 miles south of that. Portuguese expeditions had begun a century and a half before the arrival of these Jews on the Senegalese coast. Um, the first successful voyage to Senegal in 1444-1445, um, and by 20 years later, the entire part of the coast that you saw in that map had been explored. Some of the Portuguese, settling among local populations and marrying local women, even adopted local religious practices. These men were called lançados from the Portuguese lança or to throw in the, the implication being that they had thrown in their lot with local African population. The lançados and even more their offspring served as cultural bridges between Europeans and Africans. A few more terms, uh, there are, are two communities that were settled on the Petit Coast by these Jews, one the town of Joal and the other the community of Porto de Ali or Porto Dal. There they lived among a population of people called Surer and the local ruler who was a Muslim was a man named the Bursin. The other important uh, predominant ethnic linguistic group in the region of Northern Senegal is Wolof and Wolof and Serer are very closely interrelated and it is a, a fundamental and perhaps sometimes difficult for us to fathom uh, a characteristic of identity in Senegal. That identity is flexible, it is defined by context and it is often multiple leading to situations where an individual may have several names and may have uh, several ethnic identities and could be in one context a Muslim and in another context a Christian. The next group further south, the dominant group, are the Jola peoples, whom I mentioned primarily because that's, uh, that's where I lived, as Marty mentioned, for six months. And uh, at the southern extreme of the area inhabited by Jola, across the border in the present day country of Guinea Bissau, the Portuguese in the late 1500s would establish a trading center with a fortress at a place called Cacheo, which is the last term here. We're heavy on dates and we're heavy on terms, but only to try and, well, I say to orient you, but I hope it's not to, to get you busy, but there will not be an exam at the end of the session. You do not have to take notes. These Portuguese Jews, protected from Portuguese representatives of the Inquisition by local African rulers, established a religious dialogue with those same rulers. And I have to emphasize that those rulers were themselves Muslim. In a context where lanzados assimilated into local society, making local customs, local religious rituals their own, these Jews, by contrast, succeeded in maintaining their identity as Jews. Ultimately, several of them moved on to Amsterdam, some bringing with them commercial connections, and the beginnings of what would become for them considerable financial well being. A few brought wife and child back to, to Amsterdam with them from Senegal. Okay, once again, I'm having. Okay. So, just to give you a little bit of local color, I will, uh, here is a, a photograph uh, of Amsterdam familiar to at least one member of the audience, I'm sorry, of, of Lisbon, uh, looking at the uh, castle of St. George on the hill, which dates back to the 13th century, the time that Lisbon was reconquered from a Muslim settlement. And an image taken in midwinter of a canal in Amsterdam. And I have to say that it is so hot here in Frankfurt that even that midwinter canal in Amsterdam looks really delightful. 
In fact, it may be as hot today in Frankfurt, where I am, as it is on the Petit Coast, where this image was taken. This is a picture I took just inland from the coastal settlement of Joal, and it shows a rather typical landscape of open grassland broken by trees or grassland and open forest. This land would have been uh, traversable by, by cavalry in the 17th century. And indeed, one of the items that was most in demand uh, from the Portuguese Jews when they arrived to acquire ivory was horses from Europe to be used as cavalry. In Senegal, these men established two trading communities. The savannah grasslands here are relatively safe from insect-borne diseases like malaria and yellow fever, and totally free of sleeping sickness, which is why horses can survive. They traded mainly with Dutch ships. This was strictly illegal because they were on Portuguese claimed territory. But the Sephardim were helped by a wealthy Portuguese merchant named João Suero, who had purchased the Portuguese royal monopoly trading rights to the entire coast. It should be pointed out that that man was himself a new Christian, and he conveniently provided the necessary documents for Dutch ships to sail to this Iberian outpost. He paid with his two years in jail for that. The two main commodities, again, that the Portuguese acquired were ivory and dried cattle hides. The European members of both of these Jewish communities, Joal and Portugal, were all men. Some had married before they left and left their wives back in Amsterdam. I owe an apology of sorts to Suzanne here. Uh, the women wrote letters. Those letters to their husbands and brothers have survived in the archives of the Lisbon Inquisition. They survived there because the boat that they were being brought on was intercepted by the Portuguese and the letters never arrived. We hope that there may have been other letters on other boats that did survive. We were not able to get access to those letters for this study because of the pandemic. Um, so ideas for future research. What about the lives in Senegal of these Jews? Like other Portuguese traders who settled on the coast, some of these men contracted marriages with local women, daughters of elite or merchant fa families and the benefits were mutual. Both partners thereby gained ready access to goods and at advantageous prices. For the men, connections to a local wealthy family, that is to one's kin, meant that kinship was engaged in your business. And that is how business was transacted even before the arrival of Europeans in Senegambia. You need a loan or you incur a debt, then you offer a family member as a pawn as security until you repay that debt. And for marriage, of course, one also had a partner, which meant that there were children. What was the status of those children? What was their religion? Were they raised as Jews? And how did these predominantly male communities manage to survive without losing their specific identity? They did survive. The Euro-African children, the children of these marriages, at least those mentioned in archival records were raised as Jews. This meant, of course, that their identity came not through the mother, but through the father. A similar situation occurred a century later in the largest Jewish agricultural community in the world, in Suriname. Later, for those who returned to Amsterdam with their families, there was some opposition to the full inclusion in the community, at least unless the children had undergone a formal conversion. But the same was required of Portuguese born new Christians, both to join the Amsterdam Jewish community and to join the Joal community um, at the synagogue in Senegal, which is to say men who had been raised in Portugal as new Christians, including the later rabbi in Amsterdam, Manasseh ben Israel, had to undergo circumcision as adults to be recognized as full-fledged community members. This may have been the central issue for Senegalese-born Jewish children who arrived in Amsterdam after the 1620s. I'll return to that question if there's time. On Senegal's petite coast, the Jewish community was protected 
by local Muslim rulers. Of course, Jewish merchants rendered an important service by bringing thriving commerce. Nevertheless, it is worth, uh, it is worth uh, going into detail to describe an amazing meeting that occurred in 1612, a meeting between the local ruler, the Bursin, representatives of the Portuguese bishop who was the head of the inquisition on the Guinea coast and the Jewish community. Here is a, an eyewitness report preserved again in the archives of the Lisbon Inquisition. So we know this was from an informant who was part of the party sent by the Inquisition, hence not an objective observer, but we can still quite readily get a sense of what was going on in the back and forth of the arguing. And this is a, a long quote. When the Portuguese official told the king, the Borsin, to deliver the Jews to him so that his port should be put in order, the Jews replied, telling the king that we Catholics were pagans and that we worshiped stones and sticks and that we Portuguese seek to harm them because the Jews follow the way of Musa or Moses. And further that the Jews presented themselves to the Bursin as being initiated and circumcised like the Bursin himself and the other black people, not like the Christians. Give you a moment to think about that. And this might be an opportune time to stop um, to see if we have need for clarification. Um, at this point, I only see that everyone is muted, muted. But do I have to unmute you? There seem to be no specific clarifications. Well, no, they're all so, everyone is so confused no, that they don't know where to start. <laughs> I think you're so clear. The only uh, question that has arised, maybe is for later, is when does maize arrive as a crop? I didn't hear that question. What is it? When does maize arrive as a crop in the area? It does not ever arrive as a crop in, in the area. Um, if we go just a little bit south of uh, Joal, uh, at, to the Gambia, we arrive in rice growing region. And from the Gambia on south to Casamance, through Guinea-Bissau, and coastal Guinea and uh, coastal Sierra Leone today, uh, you have people who are predominantly wet rice farmers and they're growing rice in folders that is uh, surrounded by dikes to in land that has been reclaimed from tidal, uh, tidal waterways that are um, heavily uh, grown over or were before deforestation, heavily grown over with mangrove. Mangrove roots are almost like iron, meaning that you need iron implements in order to cut and as um, our colleague Walter Hawthorne, who may be here today, I'm not sure, has uh, written in book, uh, one reason for the extraordinarily high demand for iron uh, in exchange for the goods that the Portuguese were, were seeking, in, in exchange for ivory, in exchange for cattle hides, in exchange for captive, one reason that Africans were, in, were so anxious to acquire iron was that it was essential for their tools if they were to expand cultivation in the mangrove area, which was both the most fertile land and at the same time, the most inaccessible in terms of slave raiders. Nobody can bring a horse through these mangrove swamps and so you're relatively safe. Are there other questions at this point or should we? There is a question. Um, if there was a Jewish cultural life in Senegal, what was its nature? Well, um, I have to uh, explain that the, the, the direct information that José Orta and I have been able to call comes not from the mouths of the pens of Jewish participants, but from the pens of informants or from the, uh, for the Inquisition, who presented themselves sometimes as Jews, but were actually informing for the, uh, the Bishop of Cape Verde. Um, and, and so we don't have much detail. We know that they constructed a synagogue uh, out, of, um, uh, out of thatching primarily um, and, and uh, sticks, not out of permanent material in Joal. We know that they had a minion. We also know that they had, in addition to, to they must have had a Torah, but we also know that they had books um, of, of prayer. Um, and beyond that, we don't have a whole lot of detailed knowledge except for those individuals who go back to Amsterdam, and we know a bit more about their lives if they show up in 
the city archives, which they do if they're successful businessmen, in which they do if they are unsuccessful businessmen who are uh, brought to court for having debt. Okay, thank you. One, one other question is, um, how was the patrilineal issue dealt with with the Jews of Senegal I, I will, and, and apparently will, in Suriname? I will get, uh, I'll get to that a little bit in the second part of the lecture. And if not sufficiently, then they, the person is welcome to repose the question. Perfect. May I go back to the paper part two? Ah, did they have a cemetery? The cemetery? They did, but we have not seen it. Um, <clears throat> I think, and I think when we get to the questions, I'll ask if, if uh, Jose is, is still here, I'll ask if his memory is probably better than mine. I think that the cemetery is in, was in Rufis. And I know that Jose has been after me for years to try and put together a group of archaeologists, which would probably be a very good idea. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Good. So on the day in 1612, that the Inquisition representatives come to Joal and present their argument that the, to the Muslim ruler, the Bursin, that he should hand over the Jews to be arrested. Uh, again, I need to emphasize that the Bursin is a Muslim. And the question we can ask is, are the Jews being protected because they are a non-Muslim minority with Sunni status, which would be in accord with Islamic practice? Maybe, but there was something else. Most important for social interaction on the Upper Guinea coast is a long established, and I mean centuries old practice of what George Brooks has termed landlord stranger relations or host client hospitality. It still survives. The Jews as favored traders were the guests of the birth scene who was under obligation according to landlord stranger relationship to take care of them and protect them. But in their arguments, we can learn more. The Jewish merchants in their report used both religious arguments and social identity to establish common ground with their Muslim hosts. First, they argued that they, like their Muslim hosts, did not engage in iconolatry. In other words, those Catholics, they're worshiping statues, sticks and stones, images of saints. Whereas Muslims, reject that, and Jews equally reject that. Furthermore, the Jews argued that they, like Surer elders, were circumcised, and by implication, they were adult, because in, in Surer, as in the other Senegambian societies, Jola society, the uncircumcised is not considered to be an adult, even if he's 40 years old. And at least in the 17th century, an uncircumcised a person of, of any age would not be allowed to marry and found a family. So by circumcision, they are uh, like bar mitzvah, the Jews are referring to the fact that they are initiated and that they are adult. I blushed when I first read those lines in the archive because I had used precisely that argument with my own Muslim hosts in Casamance in 1975. You ought to share with me some of those secrets associated with initiation in the sacred forest, which I want to write a book about because I'm circumcised and I'm initiated just like you. If, if I were to assess how successful the argument would be, I would say that it was irrelevant uh, to the extent that after a year or years of later visits, um, individuals in position of some power came to trust me, they would probably, they probably shared with me things that, that they didn't have to share and say, well, I, if anyone calls me on it, just say, I didn't tell you. Um, but I don't think that the argument uh, in my case was successful. It does seem, however, that it helped to save the lives, fortunately, of these Jews in 1612. Another important element, however, in their integration into Senegalese commercial networks was this. When they arrived in Portugal, these Sephardim were already familiar with living dual identities. In brief, they had lived as both Christians and secretly as Jews. On the Petit Coast, far from the Inquisition, they could be more open about their Jewish identity. There was, so far as we know, no further effort by the Inquisition, at least until the, until the very late 1620s, uh, to inter, 
intercede against those Jews. Nevertheless, some of them also retained their Christian identity. One member of the community, a merchant named Joshua Israel, uses his Portuguese name, Luis Fernandez Duarte, when he writes to the wealthiest African slave trader further south along the coast. He proposes to this man, who is the king of a region called Busis, that they go into business together. He suggests that the king of Busis send him slaves in return for the goods that he will send, and that to seal the deal, the king should send to him one of the king's own sons to live with him, Luis Fernandez Duarte, and Duarte would teach him Portuguese, which would help in his own uh, commercial dealing, and would raise him as a Christian. We do find this somewhat problematic since at the time he wrote it, Joshua Israel was actually a, a, a member of the congregation in, in Joao. One, one of the marvelous aspects or advantages of doing a kind of micro history as, as we have is that you get the sense of individuals who lived in history. So rather than history just being a broad skin of, uh, of events or of large groups of people or of movement, we can actually see how uh, what we're describing, the events we're, we're studying and describing affected individuals. So I'll introduce you to three or four of those individuals. There was Yoga Vash de Sosa. He arrives on the Petit Cote in 1611. As far as we know, he's still there most of the time in 1633, although he does travel back to, to Amsterdam at least once. He had been born in Lisbon and his brother, Felipe de Sosa, unmarried, is with him in Senegal. Felipe de Sosa has the nickname Ucortovad, which means the hunchback. Yoga Felipe had an uncle who was a merchant, one of the most wealthy merchants in Hamburg. They had a cousin who was a trader crossing the South Atlantic between Angola and Rio de Janeiro. Their sister, Inis, Ines, meanwhile, lived in Lisbon and wrote to them. And uh, Ines's letter is among those that we hope eventually, um, after things open up again in Lisbon, and my condolences to all of you who are, who are zooming in from Lisbon for the unfortunate situation there. But we do hope to be able to get to see these letters someday. There was also Geronimo Rodriguez Freire, but he had another name, Jacob Peregrino. He was, in fact, the rabbi in Joao. Jacob Peregrino had his religious education in Venice. His wife lived in Amsterdam, but Jacob Peregrino brought his three sons to Senegal with them, with him. One of those sons will return to this in this narrative. There was Joshua Israel, whom we've already met, Luis Fernandez Duarte, and finally. Antonio Lopes de Mesquita, Moses de Mesquita, Moises de Mesquita. Moises de Mesquita is one of at least three of the 36 Jews who sources tell us was mulatto among these very first settlers. Apparently then his grandfather or father had already spent time in Africa and he was the product of or the offspring or the offspring of the offspring of another marriage. In 1622, Moses de Mesquita would emigrate back, would emigrate to Amsterdam, not return to Amsterdam. He went from, from Lisbon, born in Porto in the north of Portugal, and he went from Lisbon directly to Senegal. And after spending a little more than a decade in Senegal, he went to Amsterdam where he settled, he married. He had, they had two daughters, both of whom sadly died in infancy. Moses de Mesquita became wealthy, investing in global trade, and many of his partners were other members of his community. In the 1630s, he was wealthy enough that he was able to offer a new Torah scroll to the Amsterdam synagogue. He's then named Hatan Torah, begins reading of the new Torah cycle at the beginning of the year. When he's in his 50s, he becomes a member of the governing council, the Mahamat. At age 75, he's named Parnas of the Bikur Polim Society the, with responsibility for looking out for the ill. Moses de Mesquita and his wife oversee the marriage of their nephew to the granddaughter of the wealthiest member 
of the community in Amsterdam. Moses de Mesquita lived to age 91 and left an estate valued at more than 10,000 guilders. These men were merchants traveling while on the coast, trading in ivory and hides. Up to 30,000 hides could fill a single vessel as it sailed back to Amsterdam. One community member, the rabbi, who, as I said, was eternally in debt, as security for one of his debts, provided a ton of raw ivory. That's a lot of dead elephants. What about the slave trade? There were few captives available so far north in Senegal in a region that in 1610 was relatively stable in terms of African states without any civil strife of significance that were not captives and hence not a ready supply of captives for the Atlantic trade. The only time in our records up to the mid 1620s that we have found uh, evidence of significant numbers of slaves arriving at the coast was before the foundation of this Jewish community when in the year 1605 that coincided with outbreaks of, of uh, bubonic plague in Morocco and with the death of the ruler of Morocco, which meant that commerce across the desert stopped temporarily. Slaves had been sent to the primary market across the desert. And when that market became unavailable, there was a brief period around 1605 when the secondary market, which was European traders on the coast, uh, where it began to attract slaves. But by the time that the Jewish community in Jawal had been established five years later, uh, that was no longer available. Further south along the Casamance River, for example, in the forest zone, small scale societies had quickly learned to protect themselves from being captured in slave raids. Their villages were sometimes difficult to find for outsiders. And would be raiders found it almost impossible to navigate the labyrinthine network of tidal waterways. This is a relatively wide waterway, but it's a good picture of mangrove. And you can imagine that if you were going through uh, a, a, a stream that was barely wide enough for your dugout to go through, that you would be a prime target to be ambushed by people who living there knew the region much better. This enabled former victims to go on the offensive, capturing the slave raiders and acquiring themselves captives for the Portuguese market. But in a small, on a small scale. In this same geography of low-lying land, rice fields, and countless waterways, but 50 miles further south, 30 miles further south, the Portuguese established a trading settlement at a place called Cacheo on the San Domingos River. So we are now in the Casamance region here. The map is much too general to show the waterways, but it really it looks uh, absolutely intricate cross, uh, crisscrossing. And from the Casamance River to Cacheo is, oops, is 30 miles, uh, except that you don't, we're not crows. It's a lot more than 30 miles if you're not able to go as the crow flies. In 1588, the Portuguese established a fortress on a point of land on the south bank of the San Domingos River, which you see here. This actually is a later rebuilding of the fort, probably dating from about 1700. Within decades, as many as 2,000 captives a year passed through this part of the coast and many of them through Cachil. It is a easy, easily romanticized spot if you visit it today. It has the locale for a recently constructed museum to the slave trade. Uh, the boat in the river is called a pirogue and it, it consists of a dugout, a one piece dugout from a very large silk cotton tree to which sideboards have been added to make it a little bit seaworthy. It can, they can actually trade along the coast and you can put a sail on it. And these boats were developed in the course of the 17th century, the very beginning of 16th century, very beginning of the 17th century. So such boats as this would very likely have existed at Cachil at the time that these Portuguese Jews were trading 50 to 100 miles further north along the coast. Now, please excuse me 
um, a, a short visual detour. But as Marty said, I sometimes wear another hat as an art historian. And in 35 years and 20 visits to Africa, February, February 2020 in Kesheo was absolutely the first time that I have ever seen a carved wooden sculpture in situ rather than in a museum. And it's under the veranda of this house in Kesheo. And you can see a close up. It's the figure of a man wearing a large medallion across his chest uh, with a small, with a goatee. Um, and I stumbled on this taking an evening walk after a day of listening to papers about the, the slave trade. And I got back to the conference and at supper, burbling to people, look, I found this wonderful piece. And we were all interested in an evening walk. So a group of us, mostly Portuguese, walked down and I had knocked on the door. There's nobody there. I said, look, it's, there's nobody living there. So we're standing around the porch looking at this when, they, uh, when the woman who lived there came out, she was there. What are you doing on my porch? Um, and when we explained to her, her face lit up. She was so excited to have people interested in her grandfather. She said, yes, that's my grandfather. And he received libations uh, every time that, that we have a drink of palm wine. So this was my introduction belatedly to what might have been my career if I had chosen to study in Kesheo rather than to study in, in Casamance. That's the end of my little um, detour away from the Portuguese merchants. So far as we know, the Portuguese merchants only dealt with raw ivory and not with carved ivory, although carved ivory existed at the time. We have no evidence that they did. That does not preclude the possibility that, they, that some of them may have had objects. If the Sephardic merchants did not participate in the slave trade, it was not for moral scruple, as in the case of Joshua Israel, not for lack of trying either. We have records of, this, oh, by the way, this is a photograph taken very close to Kishio to give you yet another view of what the surroundings, very low lying, and this is the, in February, so there are no rice in the folder that would be quite green from July when the planting took place until harvest in November. We do have records in Amsterdam in the city archives of merchants bringing two or three or four slaves with them back to Amsterdam. Um, and I, I think you can notice that uh, there are two names here. This is a very recently typed up note card. You work in the Gemeente Archive in Amsterdam. You don't get to deal with the original papers. You don't even get to deal with microfilm. You get to deal with these type cards uh, one, uh, and, and the cards are by name, which makes it easy to track down the members of the Jewish community whom we were aware had gone back to, to Amsterdam. Uh, and here we see Gaspar Fernandez. But there are other names if you look at the top our friend Diego Vastus Tusa, the, whose brother is the hunchback, uh, is also engaged. These men have just come to, back to Amsterdam from Senegal, and they've brought with them four slaves, uh, that is to say, household servants. But they're not engaged in large scale at, uh, commerce, uh, that is the Atlantic slave trade. <clears throat> I, I begin now the, the final part of this presentation, which I have given a title to, 17th Century Debates, Modern Echoes. Many of the merchants from Senegal ultimately moved to Amsterdam. Several, like Moses de Mesquita, became prominent members of the community. These Jews, influenced by their experience in West Africa, returned to Europe deeply marked by what they'd lived. For example, as I have said, Senegal in Senegal, identity is flexible, even multiple in a way unimaginable in Europe. An individual could be Portuguese, but also African. We know of men who were Muslim, but at other moments Christian, even a slave, but at another moment nobility. And to be Portuguese or even to be considered white in Senegal was not dependent on one's skin color. This did not coincide with Northern European conception. In Amsterdam, there was inevitably pushback to these attitudes. Within the Jewish community, there were families from Senegal, all of whose members considered themselves Jewish, yet it was the fathers and not the mothers who passed on the identity. And here we may relate to questions asked within Reconstructionist Judaism. For those Amsterdam Jews who considered halacha as normative, this could obviously pose a problem. One response was that they, they did make was to mark off a special part 
of the cemetery in Amsterdam at Oudekerk. Oudekerk is five kilometers outside of Amsterdam and except when it snows, an easy bicycle ride. Another response at some point well, around 1650 was to limit membership in the Mahamat, the governing council, but things were complex and interesting because when the Mahamat did rule in 1647, the Euro-African Jews could not serve on that governing body. One of the voting members was Moses de Mesquita, himself genotypically a Euro-African. Today, among historians, a debate pretty much breaks out along orthodox versus more progressive or reformed lines. Did the Amsterdam community set out from the beginning to define themselves, to define Jews as European and as, quote, white? Obviously, Jose Orta and I strongly disagree with that racialist reading. But there is a lesson. The past is present. History is not only about the past. Now, I have promised Suzanne that I would uh, talk a little bit about the African, presumed African family of Moses de Mesquita. What about the members who remained on the Guinea coast? Can we document the adult lives of any Euro-African descendants in Senegambia? What inspired my search was a letter from Marty about two months ago telling me that a colleague of his, Usman Traoré, has traced the career of a merchant rabbi in Normandy named Jacob Peregrino. Traoré, it appears, has found our rabbi. Jacob Peregrino spent little time in Amsterdam before moving on yet again. We know why. Upon leaving Senegal, he immediately found himself in, involved in a legal case in Amsterdam relating to the loss of an entire cargo of hides that arrived water damaged from Senegal. The dispute related to lost claim. This legal problem may help to explain why he made a sudden departure from the United Provinces for Normandy. Problems seem to dog this family. Peregrino's oldest son, Manuel, who is an adult by this time, found himself in even more serious legal jeopardy when he arrived in Amsterdam he, in about 1619. And this was well documented by our colleague, Toby Green. Manuel Peregrino was accused of seducing a young lady of standing in Amsterdam by promising to marry her and then skipping out on her. No wonder Manuel returned quickly to Senegal and stayed there. He became head of a large Jewish household he was reported by French Capuchin missionaries in 1636 to be, although not by name, to be running, uh, to be running the Jewish community and to have a very large family. And his, his wife uh, was, was Senegalese. Some of the second generation from Joao, not the rabbi's family, moved to Amsterdam. There they lived as Jews, which means their identity effectively did pass through the father rather than the mother. Aviva Benin has documented the same practice among mixed families in Joden Savan in Suriname, a hundred years later. For those Luso African children who remained in Senegambia, however, the situation is less clear because the records are far more sparse. In West Africa, the Luso African offspring of Portuguese merchants benefited from local social ties through their mother's lineage. They also spoke local languages as well as Creole, Creulo or Portuguese and French and Dutch. This linguistic skill could be used to their commercial advantage. No wonder then that many Luso-Africans known as sons of the earth refused to have became merchants and served as intermediaries with local, with visiting European traders. While we were writing our book, Forgotten Diaspora, Jose and I came upon a tantalizing hint that Moses Mesquita had left his son in Senegal. A 1633 Inquisition informant refers to one Fulad Mishkita. What's his name, the Mishkita, or somebody the Mishkita? A public Jew who lived in Portugal. I have tried for 10 years to confirm whether this was, in fact, Moses the Mishkita's son. That son, if he existed, would probably have grown up to be a merchant and would have been considered Portuguese. In 1647, he would have been in his mid 30s likely in the prime of his trading career. 
On June 29th, 1647, the Captain Major of Cachil, a man universally despised by every Portuguese trader of any religion on the coast, denounced one Fernando Lopes Mosquita and four other merchants for treason. Fernando Lopes Mosquita was our Fulano de Mosquita. What's his name, de Mosquita? He was almost certainly the son of Moises de Mosquita, whose Portuguese Christian name was Antonio Lopes de Mosquita. A year later, a Portuguese warship was sent to Cachil. The ship's captain arrested the five powerful new Christians, as they were termed, or Jews, as, as they were sometimes called, including Fernão Lopes Mosquita. They were charged with professing allegiance to Spain. Now, in fairness, it has to be pointed out that Portugal and Spain were under a unified monarchy, so that Portugal was Spain from 1580 to 1640, only eight years, seven years before the charges were filed. Inevitably, if the merchants with whom you're dealing, who come from Europe, are arriving from Spain, you're going to be dealing, have your business contact with Spanish merchants. So it, it stands to reason that to the extent that you're able, you will maintain those contacts, even though Portugal has broken away and reestablished its formal independence. So these five men were taken prisoner and transported to Santiago Island in the Cape Verde Islands. But a year later, on June 29, 1649, King John or King Joao IV pardoned the accused traitors and they presumably returned to Cachil. Why Cachil? Because it was the most important slave trading port by the middle of the 17th century at a time that the slave trade had grown very much from the period when our Jewish settlers arrived at the beginning of that century. Whereas Moses de Mesquita, like the other merchants at Joal, traded primarily for ivory and cattle hides, the younger Mesquita was engaged in a very different commerce, slave trade. There is an irony here because Lopes de Mesquita was himself a Luso African Portuguese. Bear in mind, in 17th century Upper Guinea, to be considered Portuguese identity was a social class marker indicating one was a merchant and ostensibly Christian, though often as here that meant either new Christian or Jewish. Skin color was not a factor in your Portuguese identity in 17th century uh, Senegal or 17th century West Africa. But let us move our attention back to Amsterdam. After Moses de Mesquita's term on the, the Amsterdam Mahamat, dark-skinned Jews were evidently banned from serving there. I would argue, along with many other scholars, that the spread of racialist thought in the second half of the 17th century reflects the growing impact of the growing Atlantic slave trade. The irony is clear. The sun engages in the slave trade, a commerce that does, by the middle of the 17th century, have a negative impact on the social status in Europe of people like himself. Do I have three more minutes? Yes. It's impossible to conclude a story like this, partly because we are always learning new stuff, like Fulano de Mesquita, but partly because this is an ongoing community. And once you get to the end of one stage, the period in Senegal, while some people stay there, you get to looking at the development of the evolution of the community in Amsterdam. So any conclusion that tries to um, wrap things up is necessarily arbitrary and artificial. But let me be a little bit artificial and instead call it would be literary. In 1684, a Cape Verdean Portuguese merchant named Francisco de Lemos Coelho, whose attitude towards his Jewish contemporaries was to say the least critical, wrote about the two formerly Jewish communities on the Petit Coast. Of Portugal, he said, Portuguese Jews used to live here, but now there are none. And of Joao, this is a quote, the port lies beside the sea and is very pleasant and healthy and there were never any self-confessed Jews here. We witness an active erasing of historical memory. It's hard to like this guy. Lemos Cuello's most extreme comments are totally false in fact. They're based on a semantic confusion 
Among several Senegalese peoples, northern Senegalese there, and that would be Wawak and Mandinka, there is a casted group. That is, they are endogamous, they marry within the group, and they are excluded from some forms of social interaction. These men and women are professional musicians and praise singers. That includes what we would now as historians term oral historians. These men and women are sometimes called griot, which is the preferred common French term, but in their own language, they're known as Jilly. Famous Cuello and other Europeans heard Jilly as Judeo or Jew. Famous Cuello writes, in these kingdoms, there's a caste of blacks called Judeo. They are despised people, not true, and only make a living by the men playing musical instruments and women dancing. I guess Lemos Cuello didn't appreciate going to the orchestra. They earn plenty of money. I put this in here, he adds, so that it can now be seen how greatly Jews are reviled even among blacks. True, these Judeos have nothing of the Jew other than the name. However, the Portuguese Jews who used to live here were strongly reviled by the other settlers and by the local blacks. Nowadays, there are only some half-breeds, their descendants. Virtually nothing, end of quote, virtually nothing of what Emish Coelho says here is true. Um, in a certain sense, the griot is highly respected. You can see how the viewer's prejudices come into play. Um, certainly highly esteemed uh, among musicians even today with worldwide reputations are people who belong to that, uh, that group in society. Highly reviled by Blacks, well, then how to explain that the Borsin took their side and defended them against representatives of the Inquisition? Once again, erasure of historical facts. It does give form. Another image from the Jewish cemetery. You might say that Jose Orta and I, in studying the history of the Sephardic communities in Senegal, have been working to undo the historical erasure accomplished by people like Lemish Cuello, as well as by later historians who would forget the role of African Jews in the foundation of the Amsterdam community. Well, by this time in Amsterdam, the Jewish community had grown to more than 2,000 members and had newly constructed their majestic synagogue, which stands today. And Moses de Mesquita, then 80 years old, was a leading member of that community. I would like to conclude with a brief reference to Elke Klein's study of Jews in medieval Barcelona, specifically, I refer to Klein's demonstrating that Jews and Christians shared considerable common ground. Three centuries later, in early 17th century Senegal, a much smaller group of Portuguese Jews shared even their ostensible identity as Christians. Nevertheless, within the two communities of Joao and Portugal, these men managed both individually and as a group to establish and to maintain their Jewish identity. Now, that is the end of the talk, but I have a coda. Just, it's, it's like a music by Max Rager, it never ends. An additional question. Um, I have not mentioned the peoples who live off of the coast, very close to the coast, not far from Kesheo, a people called Bijogo. Now the Bijogo very quickly um, learned to protect themselves against slave raids and they became uh, fearsome slave raiders themselves for a period of 200 years. In fact, they would uh, not hesitate to take Europeans as captives and then hold them for ransom. Uh, and that continued at least until the 1790s. Um, in a museum, this is bringing together two disparate places and two disparate uh, career uh, uh, directions. One is history and the other is art history. Um, in the Ethnographic Museum in Germany in Leipzig are these two swords. They are collected from the Joko peoples in the 19th century by a German collector. Um, and you don't see the, the tip of the sword, but these are, they're actually daggers, the kind of dagger that they would have used when they uh, went out on their slave raids. And, and this fits uh, a description that we have from the 17th century source of what they look like. The reason I show you it is that on the, 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 you can see that the end of the hilt has a piece of metal. And there are two different uh, ends to the hilt. One I don't have a photograph of. 
It is a Portuguese coin, copper coin, dated 1873. The other is this. Can you see the, what is in, uh, embossed on the middle of that circle? It's a Star of David. I'll see if I can, here's the arrow. Bottom triangle there, and superimposed over this triangle here. I took a lot of pictures, that's the closest I could get, sorry. It brings up questions. We have, I have absolutely no idea where to go towards an answer or even if it's possible. Uh, but here are people who are close enough to Cacheo that they would have on occasion been bringing captives to Cacheo um, or visited by Portuguese. And among the Portuguese merchants visiting them could very, very likely have been uh, Jews or and new Christians. And beyond that, I don't know what it uh, what that originally was. Um, I don't dare ask the curator to remove it so that we can study the whole thing from the end of the hill. Um, but it's clear that something was going on. And the 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 hints we get from material culture uh, of Jewish presence are so far so rare uh, that we have to at least call attention to every time we see one. No more coda. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, those of you. Uh, no idea who's here. No idea how many people are still there. I hope some. Uh, but it's been fun on this end. Uh, this was only the third time I ever gave a Zoom talk. I'm still getting used to the fact that there's no audience participation. Uh, you all muted. But now you're unmuted. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Very interesting. There are uh, many different questions are coming up. One is, could you clarify what is a new Christian? Oh, yes, good. Um, in, six, in 1497, under extreme pressure from uh, the more powerful Spanish monarchy, uh, the Portuguese king proclaimed that all Jews had to leave Portugal under pain of conversion. You either stayed and got baptized, became a Christian, or you left, and many of uh, the Jewish community left for Morocco. Among those who stayed, um, very quickly, there, there was a problem. Um, some of you may know a book by Dr. Seuss, The Star-Bellied Sneetches, in which they're, they're, sneetches are Dr. Seuss' invention, some kind of animal, and some of them have stars on them and some don't. And the ones who have stars quickly determine that they are superior, which leads uh, some enterprising merchant to start producing star decal so that everyone can have a star. And at that point, the Star-Bellied Sneetches announced that only if you don't have a star. And so this merchant gets wealthy, removing the stars. And it, it, it would appear to me that um, some of this relates to the question of new Christian. Once everybody's a Christian, how can you differentiate uh, between the people that in some respect you did ostracize if they're the same as you? So you have to find some way to, to they, they're no longer, now they're Christian, but they're still different, they're still Jews. And so they are considered to be new Christians rather than old Christians. Um, I, I certainly invite Jose to, to elaborate on that, but that's, that's a, very, a very quick uh, overlap. Now, some of the new Christians were, were, were devout Christians. Some of them were secretly practicing Jews at risk of their life or were uh, left for places like the Petit Cote where they could be openly practicing or eventually Amsterdam, openly practicing Jews. And there were some as well who found themselves in the middle. Um, and and um, one of our colleagues, Nathan Vachtel, has, uh, has collected some really poignant testimony uh, from the Inquisition records of an individual who's on trial. And they say, well, what are you? And, and, and the person honestly answers, well, in, in some of my life, I follow the way of Jesus. And in some of my life, I follow the way of Moses. Um, so to be a new Christian is not a description of religious orientation, or at least not necessarily. Thank you. Um, there was a question asked, um, were the Jews involved in proselytizing at all? Did, did I hear correctly? Did these Jews participate in proselytizing? Was yes. That the question? Yes, to the Africans, yes. Well, not in the way that Jesuit missionaries did, not in the way that the Bishop uh, of the Cape Verde Islands did, who go in, into a town and, and uh, baptize 80 people at once. But in the respect that if, if they integrated members into their family, either as marrying them uh, or as uh, family servants, then yes, 
they did convert them. Um, probably in the case of family servants, as much out of self-interest, self self-protection uh, as religious con uh, conviction to proselytize, uh, that was it was certainly the case in New Spain, in the New World, where the Inquisition was an ever-present danger that if you had a servant working in your house who was not a Jew and they got angry at you or felt they, you were not paying them enough, they could always go to the Inquisition and get their revenge by having you arrested. Whereas if they were converted, it was no longer in their interest to report that you were a Jew, if they were also. So it was expediency. To some extent, yes. And, and I think that I would argue that we need to be careful in using that term. Uh, a, because expediency or self-interest is almost always a factor in human interaction, even if it's not primarily the, the, the dominant factor. And there are always, there are always people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer for whom uh, immediate self-interest is not a factor. Um, and secondly, uh, because now I'm throwing this out and I have not fully worked it out, but uh, in a situation that we do understand of flexible multiple identity on the coast. So you ha have a case of, of a, a merchant who in one context dealing with um, Muslim caravan is Muslim, but in another context dealing with the Portuguese traders coming from the coast, uh, emphasizes his Christian identity, that's not seen as being dishonest or uh, uh, rather it, it is, it reflects the way that people, it's one way that people establish a kind of connection, connectivity. Like when you go to a different place and you, a, a new place and you talk to people, you know so and so, okay, and then you've established, yeah, we both know this guy or that person's, that person's cousin is a friend of mine, so it's, I'm no longer a full stranger. If you can establish that your that part of your lineage or one of your lineages has a connection in this place you come to to trade, for example, then it's a way of placing you, and it's a way of placing you within an existing social network. Not dishonest, not disingenuous, but a way that things work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, another question, Peter, was uh, why do you assume that the landlord-stranger relationship? is more likely to have governed the, the scenes protection of these Jews than the Islamic custom of Dime. In this case, um, I have changed. I, I think it, that Jose and I uh, have followed a similar uh, trajectory here. I initially thought this is human status, but the role of landlord stranger post client relations is so fundamental for uh, Casamance society, for um, the society on the 50th coast and further south, uh, that the historian who has, uh, who has written the, the overall the history, histories of two of the region, George Brooks, uh, has even used that in, in the title of his first book, Landlords and Strangers. And I think he hits it on the note. Um, there's another way to answer it, which is to kind of punt the question. Um, it is very clear that when you have significant interaction between very different cultures, some institutions are readily instantly adopted and those tend to be institutions that have parallel existed that where you have comparable institutions in both of the uh, conjoining societies. Uh, and that may very well be what's going on here. So it may be that maybe it does not make sense to say, well, is it is it kidney status or is it landlord stranger? Because effectively it's the same thing. Thank you. More questions. Okay, yeah, there's more oh, there are, yeah. Um uh, the question is that Manasseh ben Israel is, was also famous for successfully petitioning Oliver Cromwell to reunite the Jews to England. Are you able to com and comment on what is the impact of his African heritage on his advocacy in other realms? I'm sorry, your voice was breaking up. Uh, I mm -hmm. heard that that Joshua uh, that that uh, Manasseh ben Israel um, goes to England uh, time of Cromwell. 
but I did not hear what came after that. Oh, I see, I see it, that he successfully was petitioning Oliver Cromwell to readmit Jews to England. And do you have any thoughts about the impact of his African heritage on his advocacy? Uh, I'm sorry, I was totally misleading there. Manasseh in Israel was not part of this community. Um, I was trying to draw, I was trying to make an argument, obviously blew it. Manasseh in Israel came from Lisbon. Um, I believe that he got out of Portugal um, by lying in a hearse and getting pulled by horses all the way into France and then uh, traveled the rest of the way. Um, subsequently, he was, uh, he had adult circumcision and, and then studied Torah and was, became a rabbi. Um, so he did not have direct, so far as I know, did not have direct experience uh, with Africa. Um, but he's, in a sense, it's, 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 a, it's a close question because he does write about these people who have been found in the new world. And he, you know, who are these, we call them Native Americans or Indians. Who are these people? Are they, and he suggests they could be the lost tribe. Um, it would be interesting, nobody's done this yet. It would be interesting to compare the way in which Manasseh in Israel is trying to understand this newly discovered part of the world. I mean, from a European perspective, newly discovered and integrate them into the worldview we already have. And, the experience that people like Moses Mishkita had with a different part of the world and integrating them into the world experience. In other words, time for a kind of a broad, um, a broad overview, not the sort of thing that I'm very good at doing. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Um, uh, are you able to discuss the extent to which the Jews on the coast participated in local African religious, social, or healing practices? Am I, are we able to establish the degree to which these Jews on the coast uh, participated in local African religion and? Religious, social, or healing practices. It's a great question which is the way you answer a question you can't answer. Um, it's a great question. Um, and I don't think we've found anything on that yet. There is ongoing research uh, about precisely that issue in terms of Portuguese and other Europeans uh, assimilating or responding against uh, or both uh, the, the use of local medicine or local medicine plus spiritual contact. Um, and I know that Jose Orte is, is um, focusing on that aspect of, of uh, relig religious interaction between Euro-Africans and, and Africans. But as far as specifically um, New Christian and Jewish Euro-Africans, no. But I would say now that I have, to my satisfaction, uh, found Moses Mesquita's son, um, the next thing to do is to find out where he appears in the archives um, and see if uh, see if there are any hints there of uh, any kind of interaction with. Uh, obviously, there has to be if you're a merchant, you have to be interacting with local society on the level of family structure. Anytime you're engaged in um, in any kind of business loan, any kind of uh, thing where you're trying uh, a, a transaction where you're trying to establish mutual trust with someone you don't know. It's not trust, and it's security for what you're doing. You you start dealing with family members and human beings. So people who are subordinate to you get exchanged. Uh, so a member of the crew on this Portuguese ship gets sent as a hostage uh, to the king with whom you're trading, and he in turn sends a subordinate who's held on the ship. If the ship sails. Uh, if the ship sails with that guy uh, to sell him to slavery, then you've got members of their crew that you hold. And there's no more trade with any other European who shows up until that gets uh, solved and people get brought. And people actually do get brought back from slavery, although it's usually only members of local African elite who are free. If that could relate to very, it does inevitably relate to ritual because we, the, to, to ensure the uh, security of trade, of, of trade on the coast, you have annual rituals that are performed, and they must be performed. And if you're if you're a Portuguese or Euro-African dealing uh, 
on the coast in Cacheo or further south, you do not participate in trade until the annual ceremony is taking place. So in, in a sense, we already have the answer there. It, it, it is highly likely that the younger Lopes de Mesquita participated at least as a bystander in such an annual ceremony because his safety as a European trader depended upon the annual performance of that ritual. Um, I do see that some people have raised their hands, Neil and Ralph as well. I'm going to take one or two more written comments and then I'll go to the people who raised hands to unmute. But one so question. The people who raised their hands did put that in the chat now, so we're good. Oh, thank right. you. I haven't seen it. Great. Okay. Um, uh, can you, Peter, comment on how all of this relates to the Africans across the continent claiming their Jewish heritage? Some no. based on Ethiopia? No, no, I can't. Sorry. No, okay. That's um, good. Okay, let me just go back up here then. Uh, um, from a uh, multiple identity seem to be a reality with most first generation immigrant people in that they are Portuguese in their home families and Senegal outside. Is that normal reality? Um, I'm not sure I understand the import the, the direction of that question. Um, I would say, if I, if I heard it correctly, the question is really about the nature, uh, whether, let me ask the, the person who posed the question whether the following is an accurate restatement. Are you asking whether having multiple and even contradictory identities is normative in Senegambia? Because if you are asking that, the answer is yes. Uh, Gila was asking that, so I don't know if she can raise her hand and let us know. No, I don't see. But if we get um, that uh, response, Peter will get back to you with that thing, okay? okay? Um, so are there any traces of Jewish traders in old trading posts, Saint-Louis, Goray, Rufisk in Senegal? Rufis, yes. Hmm. Gore, I don't know. Okay. And there is uh, appreciation and thanks for the fascinating and illuminating lecture that you have been giving. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, is there a Jewish community in Senegal now, or just individuals? And Boy. what, what yeah. about relationships with Israel and Israelis? I do not know. I don't know the answer to that. I deal with I deal with the 17th century. Jose and I deal with the 17th century, not with the 21st. I have enough trouble with the 21st century at home. <laughs> um, maybe this is uh, after your research period as well. But given that Spain and Portugal both have programs to grant citizenship relatedly to people who can prove Sephardic heritage, how can your research um, be leveraged to help Sephardic? Community. Wow. Hey, Jose, we could sell this information. Mm. Um, well, that, you know, that, that's not an easy, that's not a, there's not a jocular answer to that. That would obviously depend upon people having survived the, the Holocaust because so much of the, the, so many of the descendants of this Amsterdam community met with a terrible fate after the invasion of the Netherlands in 1940. But if, if it's possible, you know, if people have got um, records, they can take them back um, and connect them to members of that community, it, it should be possible. Sure. Interesting. Um, you mentioned there were three dozen or 30 Jewish men uh, yeah. When they went to Senegal, were they still practicing exile on Jews? Were they still practicing as Jews? At, at this point, I really uh, want to, I'd like, if it's possible, to um, un, unmute Jose Orta if he wishes to respond. Uh, but let me first say, most of our knowledge about the early years of this community in Senegal comes from the Inquisition records, but not from friendly sources. And by definition, 
if 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 those Inquisition informants are accurate when they say these men wanted to exercise their religion, and that's one of the reasons they went to Senegal, then by definition they were they would have been hiding that before they left, right? Because you risk getting called before the Inquisition, and if it happens to you twice, you're going to be burned at the stake. Uh, so you, it's absolutely essential that you hide your identity beforehand. So it's not, there's not going to be a record of it. Uh, because the fact that they survived means they were hiding it successfully. Then they get to Senegal and they're able to, uh, and they're able to practice Judaism. But what we do have are a couple, at least one example of a new Christian trader who's uh, further south, uh, who comes to Tuwal to get circumcised. So we know that that he wasn't living as a uh, as a full fledged Jew in, in before he got to the coast. So, say, do you want to add anything? Yes, I have a couple of things to add. Okay. Well, first, I would like to say I'm very happy to be present in this memorial. It's really, uh, it's really fine to share uh, also this moment uh, with Peter and with all of you, of course, and uh, especially, of course, to Suzanne and Martin. Um, just to say that um, several things. Uh, one of the issue is for sure they practice Judaism in Senegal at that time. Uh, for sure, um, all the all the, the 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 information we have about circumcision, even about well the question of cemetery, it's really a, an issue. But we know that in Rufisk there was a cemetery. We don't know a lot about that, uh, as a matter of fact. But there was a third community in Rufisk that unfortunately, uh, fortunately for them, unfortunately for us, of course, uh, did not set the uh, Inquisition uh, inquiry or, uh, well, or, or people going there and trying to imprison or trying to know information. And so uh, we don't know a lot about this community of Rufisk, but uh, everything says that uh, there was uh, pre uh, Judaism being practiced uh, inside these communities. And as, as Peter said, depending on what are the partners they want practice Judaism near a, a African ruler that would like to have a Christian as a partner. So that's the point. And yeah. also to add uh, about, um, uh, well, first I want to say, Peter, I loved your coda. I love your coda, uh, your coda. <laughs> I was completely surprised. <laughs> I <laughs> yes, I haven't you. told you this. Okay, that's fine. Well, something more to work on. Yes, about the as, uh, excuse me, as soon as you let me into Lisbon. <laughs> okay, and also about the Bijogo sword. Uh, yeah. Anyway, what was the date of it, of the sword? Well, the coin was 1873 or 1876. We don't know that that, that, that uh, Star of David is uh, created at the same time. It probably is, but it could be much older. The, the coin could be much older. Yes, but look, at, at 19th century, we have here Alma Gottlieb, she was in the audience. Uh, there was an, another generation of Jews that were coming from Morocco and were coming to Guinea-Bissau region at that time. So, well, it would not be a big mystery about right. that. Uh, right. Just, just say something about the proselytism. I really, uh, as you said, and as we wrote in our book, there was indeed proselytism at that time. And that's not a surprise. I, like Peter, I have not a big picture in a, a long uh, durée uh, of Judaism, of course, but uh, talking about with my colleagues in, in my in School of Arts and Humanities, there are very, uh, there are several, and we know that there are several episodes of, proselyti of Ju uh, Jewish proselytism. So it's not a big surprise. In th this context, there is indeed, well, there is the, the case in, in uh, Amsterdam, we know that uh, Portuguese would try to, to convert Africans in Amsterdam to, to Judaism. And, uh, and as an answer, complementary answer to the question, there was indeed a document of coming from the church, very worried because uh, these Jews were converting Africans. There is one document, but to, to history, sometimes one document is enough evidence because we have to explain that document. And so indeed there was proselytism in, in, uh, uh, in what nowadays Senegal or something like north of Senegal. And um, uh, also about the question of Dimi. Uh, 
to compliment Peter, of course, uh, landlords and strangers, of course. Uh, but, and even more than that, there is a, um, a saying uh, by the, um, the leader of uh, the ruler of uh, the, the Ten, the ruler of Portugal, that was reproduced both in the Inquisition documents and in the André Donelha, an account of the 17th century, saying the same thing to, uh, the, the, to the Ten, as a matter of fact, to the ruler of Portugal, he said, my land is a free market, is a feira franca. So you would not have, you will not have a war in my land or about religion or another issue because it is a free market. So that was the big value for these rulers. It was to have a free market, have all the ships they could receive and trade everything they could uh, uh, trade. And uh, just to, to, to finish, the, the issue of swords, Peter, don't, don't forget the issue of swords. Right. Very important. They also traded in swords and uh, blade weapons, of course, was a forbidden uh, uh, trade in a Portuguese perspective if it was done with infidels. And, uh, and so, um, well, that's it. I loved your lecture. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comments. I have some, I have two more questions here as well. One in relation to the point about the flexibility of identity yes. and idea that you can inhabit different religious identities in different yes. contexts. Yes. But weren't they protected legally by Muslim rulers as uh, Giza paying Jews and having to carry with them evidence of their protected status? And so does that not limit the flexibility of identities? Um. The only form of ident of the only proof uh, for safety that I know is, is that you would be in in some region, probably south of where we're talking about, in small scale society, um, living traders would be given something like a knife when they were in a village that was uh, that gave them it's like a passport it would give them safe conduct into the next village even if the two villages were fighting. Um, I'm not a, I mean. As far as some other kind of evidence, well, it would be verbal. I mean, you could, I suppose, uh, you had literate um, Muslim teachers called Pisserines at the time. We now say Marabou in French. Um, but they were a tiny, tiny, small part of the population. And most of the population were not Muslim anyway. So you had a very, very small number of individuals who were literate in Arabic. You had some. Uh, some uh, African rulers and their families who were literate in Portuguese or uh, in Portuguese, uh, we, we know of at least three uh, in, in the 16th century who were literate in Portuguese, including the king who was a slave trader who received the letter from Luis Fernandez Blas, um, Joshua Israel. Uh, he's writing to a guy who's literate. Um, but I don't think that there would, if I, if I heard the question correctly, I don't think that there would have been any kind of written document um, and, and the other thing is, look, we live in a, in a world where everything is known instantly electronically and where you can travel physically very, very quickly, great distances. In those days, it would normally take, I think, three days or four days to go the 250 miles from the Cape Verde Islands to Cachio. But we have an or, or to Bissau a little longer. But we have one example in the 1690s where the winds are blowing the wrong way and the bishop gets on a boat. It takes him three weeks to go 250 miles. Well, I mean, if it's that hard to travel, it's pretty easy to get away from a place where people know you as this guy and then you become something else. And it doesn't matter unless you're up against the Inquisition. But let me give one example. In, <clears throat> in the 1580s, um, the Portuguese merchant whom Jose mentioned, the guy named Andre Donelia, um, travels up the Gambia River 200 miles to the largest trading town on the Gambia River. And he comes ashore and he runs into, immediately runs into a guy who is his next door neighbor in the Cape Verde Islands, now 450 miles away. Only when next door neighbor, he was a tailor and a slave and a Christian. And he runs into him here, and the guy is a Muslim, he's free, and he is the, he's part of the social elite. He is the nephew of the ruler, and he's going to inherit uh, the, the, the town 
and, and, but he's wearing Muslim garb. And he takes, he takes uh, Donelia in, into a side street and he says, don't worry. And he reaches inside his rope and he pulls out a crucifix. He says, I'm, I'm a Christian. He said, but you have to understand I'm the number two person here and it's all, they're all Muslim. So I have to have to do this. And by the way, let's, let's, if you want to do business with me, I'll give you good prices. And no, there, nobody has any problem with that. Interesting. Um, I know I'm just aware of the time and I'm delighted you're still willing to take questions. But one is why would the Jews escaping from the Portuguese Inquisition choose to flee to another Portuguese country? They are so far away from the tentacles of the Inquisition when they're on the petite coast that there is only this one attempt in the entire, say, 15 year period that we studied in detail. And we can extend that out to, uh, to 1629 when the, uh, when the Dutch very briefly captured the petite coast from the Portuguese. Uh, there, you, have to be, you have to be pretty unlucky in uh, on this part of the coast to run afoul of the Inquisition. And you could see that that there are conflicting interests because the Portuguese are trying desperately to hold on to their trading commercial advantage that they're losing progressively to other European nations. So when this despised Captain Captain Major uh, in Quecheo in, uh, in 1647 says, we have to arrest these guys because they're not because they're Jews because they're dealing with the Spanish. Um, they get arrested, but a year later, the king pardons them. Why? Because he needs them as traitors. They're the only Portuguese traitors he's got there. If he puts them in jail, he's just given over a monopoly to the trade to the Spanish and the Dutch and the French. Interesting. And there was a question, now you, you more comment and more is being asked about Jewish circumcision in Senegal. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Can I say more? Um, I don't remember who is the Moel. Jose, do you remember who is the Moel? If, if it's been unmuted. There, there was a, a Moel and it was not Jacob Peregrino. I don't remember. Okay. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, it was uh, Peregrino himself, of course. And then his son, uh, okay. and then his son, and that's the the, the very important moment where people really could uh, uh, could uh, um, could make all the initiation in uh, in Senegambia before they couldn't. So it was really a, a crucial moment to the to the history of these communities in this sense. And we know that uh, that was of course this this continued. Uh, all these decades in the 17th century until maybe the 40s, we don't know exactly. Uh, but that's what, what we can say. Uh, so uh, both in Joal and Portugal, and of course in Rufisk until they could do it um, because of what Peter said, the, the war with the, between the Dutch and the Portuguese and so on. Uh, so there is a, a certain moment where uh, that, it was, uh, that community was interrupted or in some way. Uh, but that would be uh, a common practice in Joao and, um, and Portugal, of course. Uh, hmm. Oh, Jose, I have to offer you condolences for last night's game. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, we'll see with the French. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, that seems like that could be a good comment to thank the speakers on. <laughs> uh, as we move to another topic. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Aggie Meinhard and on behalf of the Adult Education Committee of Darche Noam, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Peter Mark and also Jose uh, for this uh, wonderful journey that you took us on from Europe to Africa, then back to Europe, but a journey through time. And 
what what was really fantastic was you're providing us with these glimpses of these fascinating individuals. And so what we got was an idea of what life was like for individuals rather than just a, a broad sweep of history. And while I was being transported to the past by you through these individuals and their stories, I was reminded that things don't change as much as we think they do. Yeah. Yeah. Because today we see many Jews doing the same thing, melding into the societies that they're at for both good, like Jews became slave trade, for both bad, like Jews became slave traders and good and all the good that Jews have done in the different societies that they participated in. And so I think that you said it, Peter, that uh, history never ends. It's just a progression and it repeats itself and repeats itself. Yes, yes, and uh, I for one, and I think everybody was fascinated by many of the things that you brought up, but especially, uh, the idea of multiple personalities, because in our modern world, don't we all yeah. um, in, inhabit multiple identities as we go through our lives? Yeah. Yeah. So I do want to thank you again from me, but from everybody. And we had a wonderful turnout. And it was so nice to see all these different people in their little windows. And I hope that you got a chance also to see at some point how many people were. Uh, well, I would like to, listening to you. I would like to make one more comment. I mean, this has been absolutely a delight. This has been so much fun. And I, at the end, after only at the end did I look through and see some friends and colleagues, colleagues who are friends and have been for a long time. And I also want to uh, want to uh, say I, I'm very grateful as well that my mother is in the audience. Um, so uh, I, I'm sure that, that she will um, have uh, found some errors in what I've said as she was the one who actually did the final editing when Jose and I put our book together. Um, so I'm sure that she will be, be making me aware of some of the errors that the rest of you didn't hear. Thank you all for coming. It's been wonderful. Thank you.